Is that better? Yeah. More better? Yeah. <laughs> All right, anyway, last week we started the epistle written, recorded rather, by Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to the church at Colossae, and we got the first handful of verses uh, dealing with the overview and the greeting and the thanksgiving that Paul has for this church for whom he's never met. And now he's going to pray for them. And of course, it's a spirit-led prayer inspired by the Holy Spirit, broken up into a petition for them, as well as a praise to him to whom only praises are due. So we resume in verse 9 and reading our Bibles carefully, it says, for this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we that ye might walk worthy of the lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So, circling back up to verse 9, for this cause, what cause? The report that Epaphras gave to Paul and Timothy about this church in the verses that preceded verse 9, their faith in Christ Jesus, their love for the brethren, which is evidence of their faith, uh, the, the hope that was reserved, is reserved for them in heaven, and the fruit of the gospel that can be seen in their lives, the love in the spirit. So for this cause, we also, Paul and Timothy, who received this report from Epaphras, uh, they, as Epaphras and with Epaphras, do not cease to pray for you. Repeating what he said in verse 3, praying always for you. He said it again shortly thereafter. I think emphasizing that we, they, we have continual access to the Father that is in heaven, personally. I think about that sometimes, driving to play ball, and I want to contribute. I don't want to be a drag, and it's a silly thing. It's a, almost a, it's, it's a silly, silly prayer, because what's going on in the world? Mind-blowing things. How many people are there in the world? Uh, Eight billion. How many stars are there in heaven that are being... And he can hear my voice. He wants to hear my voice. He wants to hear your voice. The channel is always open. And he always hears, and he always cares. And in his way, and in his time, he acts. So, a, a reminder that we cease not to pray for you and to desire. Now Paul's going to get into the things that he desires for them. There's really two things. Uh, that you might first, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Again, Paul is being inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's being directed to record these words. These are in his heart. This is really what's in his heart. But what is in his heart started in the heart of the Father and communicated to him by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's desire for them and for us is that we would be filled which means to the brim, to be crammed full, like maybe uh, a duffel bag of those toys, crammed full, room for nothing else, that we would be filled with the knowledge, the discernment of, our personal awareness, our personal knowledge of his will. Because the Father has a will on a grand scale, but he has a will on a very granular scale also, and that is for each of us individually. And that's why that 
bulletin message that I heard earlier this week resonated with me. His will. God is not there for my purpose. I am here for his purpose. And the Lord God in heaven, who can be known and who will be known, desires that each of us individually would be in one accord with him. That we would be of one mind and one heart with him and with each other. That we'd have the same mind. And what mind is that? The mind of Christ. His will is that each of us individually would be Christ-like in the days in which we live, which becoming increasingly Christ-hating world, we're to be Christ-like. And he wants us to be faithful to him, whatever the situation is, whatever the circumstance that we're facing. And isn't that reasonable? That's reasonable, right? That he would want us to be in one accord with him, to have his mind. I mean, we, people like to be with people that like what they like. Yeah? Well, we have a, a fellowship in, in that situation when we're with people who like what we like. When we are with like-minded people, there's a fellowship that's significant. And there's also peace. Now, in Scripture, the body of Christ is told to be, in all parts, we're told to be like-minded, to be in one accord with the head to act, to think, and to speak with his mind, and therefore to be at peace amongst ourselves. Uh, our maker, as revealed in the word of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is like-minded within the Godhead and desires that his people would be like-minded with him. And how is that? In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In all wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? Socrates? Plato. No. Wisdom comes from the only wise God. It does not, it cannot be found in the world. The world's wisdom is foolishness to God. And God's wisdom is foolishness to the world. God's wisdom is revealed to us in his word. And we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6, Israel being spoken to, keep therefore and do them. Them meaning the statutes, the commandments that God has given to Moses and given to them. Do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. They're way different than us. They think different than us. They see things different than us. They see things through the eyes, through the word of their God, the one true and living God. Uh, we're told in James chapter 3, starting verse 13, that who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, out of a good lifestyle, his works with meekness of wisdom to show a lifestyle of wisdom means that just like faith, wisdom can be seen. Not just heard, but how we live can be seen by people who are watching, and there's a lot of people watching. Show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts glory not and lie not against the truth this wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthy sensual and devilish the world's wisdom results in envy and strife not peace for envy and where envy and strife is there is confusion in every evil work but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, and easy, be, easy to be entreated, meaning easy to receive, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, playing no favorites, and without hypocrisy. 
And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Wisdom comes from the creator of the world. It does not come from the world. And the fullness of wisdom and knowledge, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid where? In Christ. Next chapter, we'll get there. Not next week, but in the right time. Uh, so wisdom is knowing Jesus and making him known. Personally, <laughs> relationally. And doing that is wise. Not doing that is foolish. Verse 9 again. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The Holy Spirit's desire for us is that we would have a very high spiritual IQ. Of him and of the things of God. We're to have a high spiritual IQ of the one true and living God. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 9 verses 23 and 24 told a people who did not have a high spiritual IQ. Uh, he said, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth, glorieth in it. You want to boast something? Boast about this. That he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, saith the Lord. You want to be wise? You want to have understanding? Know me. How do we know him? By his word. How do we understand his word? By his spirit. Jesus Christ is the living word. It's the spirit of Christ who is our teacher. Jesus is the greatest revelation of the one true and living God to mankind. And the more we know him, the more we understand him. And the more we know and understand him, the more that we love him. And the more that we love him, the more that we think like him, speak like him, and act like him. And that's the desire that God has for us to know him. And also, it says, you know, to, to know of his things, to know the things of the one true and living God. And his things are spiritual, and they are eternal. They're not material and temporary like the things of this world. We're not to covet the things of this world. We're to covet the things of God. And we talk about these things, being born again, being saved. We talk about love, which is the Greek word agape, which is not natural. We speak of grace and redemption, and these are relational truths. And we speak about resurrection unto eternal life. And we speak of the second death. And we speak of light and darkness. And those are spiritual realities. In the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul would write in chapter 2, starting verse 11, that the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we, remember he's writing the church at Corinth, we, regenerate man, born again by the will of God, children of God, Jesus kind, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. We speak? What does that mean? We receive them, but we speak. What does that, if we speak, what are we doing? We're sharing with others. We receive, and then we share with others. Which things also we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We talk about those things, born again, being saved, second death, eternal life, resurrection. You speak of those things, you share those things with someone who doesn't believe. Do they get it? No. I didn't. But you speak them. And... Maybe the heart is soft. And they say, well, what are you? I don't understand. What does that mean? Or I watch how you 
how you live. Why? How? I'm curious. I want. Or it's hard as a rock and it bounces right off. Either way, we plant the seeds. We share that which was seeded in us. And these things are spiritual. When Jesus was taught in the synagogue in Capernaum, the, the bread of life sermon, he said in verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you are spirit and are life. And we receive. And as we receive, we give. So Paul's first desire is that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. His second desire for them, verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So the Holy Spirit's desire for the church at Colossae his desire for the church here in Ahwatukee, his desire for us individually is that we would walk worthy of the Lord. That we would live uprightly in the world. Before God and before man. As we have been taught by our teacher, the Holy Spirit. And in our study of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we have been taught by him to walk. And every time you hear walk, what's the word you should hear? Live. How we live. We're to walk or to live in the newness of life. We're to live not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We've been taught to live by faith and not by sight. We've been taught to live in the spirit. We've been taught to work, to, to live worthy of our calling from God. To live not as unbelievers live. To, to walk in love as Christ loved us. To live as children of the light. And to live circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. To live in Christ, which we'll get to in chapter 2 and in chapter 4 we'll get to to live in wisdom toward them that are without live in wisdom according to those who are outside the body of Christ outside the kingdom of God and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to live honestly toward them that are without we're the witnesses of Jesus Christ to those within and to those without we are to live accordingly. Easy, easy peasy maybe? Challenging? Very challenging. The flesh doesn't want to do any of those things. But we have opposition also from the world. Uh, this is a very challenging thing to, to live as we've been taught by the Holy Spirit since we live in a hostile environment and we face unrelenting spiritual attacks all, all the while. And as we discussed a little bit last week this world is not our home this world is not our friend you look around everything's upside down everything's inside out uh, and just a personal thing the, I don't know if you saw the, the news item from Ontario Canada this week you know how you the delivery companies place boxes on people's porches and now they have rings and other devices like that so they film people stealing their packages. The police said, do not, do not post videos of those thieves because you're invading their privacy. <laughs> and I saw that and I thought, you know, I don't belong here anymore. I'm gone, I'm done. You know, this is so bizarre. Uh, but God, right? God has told us it would be like this. And he has a purpose for us to live before him and before them in these days. 
and it's challenging, and so he has empowered us with his spirit so that we can follow Jesus. And while we think, okay, Lord, today, uh, we have to persevere and steadfastly live Holy Spirit-empowered lives because it's getting more and more challenging. And, but in so doing, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Pleasing to whom? Our God, our Father in heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who indwells us. We're called not to be hearers only of the word, but doers of the word, lest we deceive ourselves. We have to abide in the true vine, of course, that's Jesus, and bear fruit that is pleasing to the Father. What does the Father want from our lives? Christ-likeness. The voice from heaven, speaking of Jesus, the Son in whom I am well pleased. So if we're to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, we must abide in Christ. And that's a decision that we make every day, maybe throughout the course of all day. But if we do, then we'll be fruitful in every good work. What's a good work? What's good? Let's start with that. What's good? Yes, take out an O and capitalize the G. God is good. There is no flesh that's good. There's no good thing in our flesh. Why do you call me a good master, Jesus would say. There is one that is good, that is God. So what is a good work? A God work. And we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, that God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We fruitful in every God work. Repeating myself, God is not there for my purpose. I am here for his purpose. We walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, we were in Ephesians prior. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1 as we consider increasing in the knowledge of God. Ephesians chapter 1. This was Paul's, part of Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus. Starting verse 16, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Wisdom is a revelation from God. Knowledge of God is a revelation. He reveals himself in creation. He reveals himself in the word. His greatest revelation is of Jesus Christ, who is the very subject of all these words. We to grow in our knowledge of God. Uh, we're to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Apart from grace, every relationship is on fire. But with grace, there's healing. Grace is not natural. It's not what the flesh wants to do. It's the nature of God. We're to grow as every child that is nourished grows. We have another grandchild. Carter David, born on Thursday night. He's a blondie. Wow, we got a blondie. But he's so cute. He's not so small. He was nine pounds, one ounce, 22. Inch. But he, and he is, getting nourished in order to grow. We were all 
children, we are our children of God. We didn't get born again and were mature. We were babes drinking the milk of the word to grow. But after the milk comes the meat. We're to grow and be nourished in the word of God. We're to therefore grow in our personal relationship with God which comes by growing in our knowledge of the Word of God. How do we grow in our knowledge of the Word of God? Uh, you read it every day, and during the day, if you do it in the morning, which is my suggestion, you read it in the morning and you have something to think about, to chew on through the course of the day. But then, you don't just read it and think about it, you study it personally, and you gather with like-minded believers. You know, I love coming to church to be with you all because of Jesus. I love getting together with you on, on Wednesday night and the Tuesday nights or the Thursday night, whenever we get to, I just, I love that. I love it on Wednesday morning. Uh, and, and if you don't like getting together, with like-minded believers, you might have to ask yourself what kind of mind you got. But I know for a fact all of us, no matter how mature we may be in our walk with the Lord, we ain't arrived. The Lord, we all have issues. The Lord's still doing work. We still got things to grow in. We got things to lose. I know that each of us, all of us, are not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and that's the mind of christ jesus increasing and us decreasing as we deny ourselves pick up our cross and follow him wherever it is he's leading us individually and when we obey when we follow by faith because we don't know where he's taking us but we follow him by faith when we obey we grow. We grow in our relationship with him. We grow in our understanding of him. We grow in our love of him. And so, to the Father in heaven, obedience has a very sweet fragrance. Every father, every mother here knows obedience is sweet. Disobedience, not so much. It takes a lot of work. But the fragrance of obedience to our Father is our submission and our humility. And when we humble ourselves before him, when we submit to his will, when we actually do what we say we believe, we grow in understanding. We grow in our knowledge of him. And we need help, do we not? That's why the Holy Spirit was sent to give us the power from on high to be the witnesses of Jesus Christ and how we follow him and how we witness of him is according to his power, his strength, his dominion. In the last letter, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, as in the, in the part where we learn how to stand with Christ, we stand being strong in the Lord, in, in the power of his might. Paul, we think of him as a, you know, a spiritual superstar. Did he have issues? Sure he did. Did he have physical issues? Yeah. He had something that we don't know certainly what it was, but he called it a thorn in the flesh. And he asked the Lord to take it away. What did the Lord say? My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So when we more clearly see our weakness, we can more clearly see his strength. That requires humility, and humility is a beautiful thing in the eyes of God. Jesus told us, he, well, he told his 11 guys before he went to the cross at the end of chapter 16, after this long teaching, John 13, 14, 15, and 16, I tell you these things, that in me, you might have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. Have any of us overcome the world? It's a trick question. It's a trick question. Of our strength, categorically not. In Jesus is, is Jesus stronger than the world? Categorically, yes. So, have any of us overcome the world? Well, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You've overcome the world by his strength and by abiding in the true vine unto all patience, long-suffering with joyfulness, we bear fruit. Fruit before God that's pleasing to the Father, fruit before men to consider. And fruit that's described here is patience. I'm not good with that one in terms of how I interpret the word. And the word is, um, well, am I patience with you? Put her in a bad spot. Now, by and large, I'm very patient with people. By and large, I'm very impatient with things. Things should never break. Oh, <laughs> this thing should work every Wednesday. <laughs> Patience is, the, the Greek meaning of the word patience is cheerful endurance of life behind enemy lines as strangers and pilgrims and soldiers here. Cheerful endurance. Long-suffering. What's long-suffering? Long-suffering is fortitude. You heard the phrase intestinal fortitude? That guy's got a lot of intestinal fortitude. Doesn't mean he's got a strong stomach. It means he has the courage and determination to do what is necessary, even if it's difficult and unpleasant. Long suffering. And patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Doesn't say with happiness. Happiness is an emotion. Emotions change just like that. Joy can stay. Joy is an emotion transcending frame of mind of being cheerful and being long-suffering because we win. We have won. It comes with victory. Joy comes with victory. And we have the victory in Christ Jesus. So we can, by his strength, be patient and be long-suffering. So now moving away from the petition for the church, Paul moves into praise to him who alone is worthy of all praise. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So, we are to be always and profoundly thankful and grateful to the Father and his dear Son. First, the Father. Described or in verse 12, what has the Father done for us? He has made us. Made. Who did the making? He did. It's his work. It's his doing. It's not something that we have to attain of our own merit or effort. It's his work. He's made us able to be partakers, to be participants. If you're a participant in what God is doing, you're an insider. You're not a spectator on the outside looking in. You're on the inside. He's made us to be partakers of the inheritance. Who gets an inheritance? Children, if we get an inheritance from the Father, we are his children. And his children are called in inheritance of the saints. Those who believe, those who trust, 
Those who lean on him are saints. They have an inheritance in light. What does that mean? Inheritance in light. Well, we're told in John chapter 1, verse 4, that in Jesus was, is life. And that life is light. To have inheritance in light is to have an inheritance in life. And what kind of life are we talking about? Eternal life. We have an inheritance in eternal life. In our corporate reading in Psalm 112, verse 4, it says, Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. Upright are those in whom God is well pleased, who have believed his testimony of his Son, in whom he is well pleased. Those are upright. And by grace through faith, when we believe the Father's testimony of his Son, what happened in our hearts? Light arose in the darkness of our hearts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, we were told, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, being having an inheritance in light, we are now lights in a very dark world. How long? Just a vapor of time, really. You get all discouraged about what's going on. You get so fed up with what you see in the world. We're only here for a little bit. We have to remember what comes next. And in case you forgot, let's go to Revelation chapter 21. What comes next? Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. What's one of the dimensions of this heaven and this earth? Time. Time is not a dimension in the new heaven and the new earth. We'll no longer be prisoners in time or of time eternal and there was no more sea and I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband I heard a great voice out of heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God does anybody have an understanding of what that's like in the very presence of God. It's not part of this heaven and this earth. It is the central point of the new heaven and the new earth. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. Overcometh what? Death, the world. How do we overcome? Faith. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Sliding down to verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And I am willing to bet that in that light and in that glory, the sun, even at its greatest strength, is going to seem like a very dull light bulb. 
and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. In the next heaven, in the next earth, we're going to dwell with the light. We're going to dwell in the light, and that forever. We have the light indwelling us now, and we're to let our light shine in this dark world, and it's challenging, but it's only for a little bit of time. So hang in. Don't ever give up. Back to Colossians. Verse 13, what has the Father done? He's delivered us from the power of darkness. The power, the control, the mastery of darkness. If light is life, what is darkness? Death. He has delivered us from the power of eternal death. And that's why Jesus came, Hebrews chapter 2, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, chain broken. And we read and studied in Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 8, that now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing, because God said, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death no, has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been delivered from death and darkness. We've been translated into light and to life. The kingdom, it says there, of his dear son. I think I have time, so let's go to John chapter 5. The kingdom of Jesus Christ. Didn't come the first time to establish his kingdom. He came to defeat our enemy and to deliver us from that kingdom into his kingdom. John chapter 5. Starting verse 21, Jesus speaking in Jerusalem. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death to life. When we believe, when we trust, when we lean on, not when we get our act together. When we lean on Jesus, we're passed from eternal death to eternal life. In John chapter 6, there in Capernaum now, John chapter 6, starting in verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He said it again. Must be true. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, in jest, believe, lean on, trust, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The, Jew, the Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, nourishment, and my blood is drink indeed, 
nourishment. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. And if, lest you forget, slide down to verse 63. Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Words of eternal life. In John chapter 11, in Bethany, on his way back to Jerusalem. John chapter 11. Lazarus died. Martha comes out, verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Physically dead, alive forever, eternal life, spiritual life. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die spiritually. Believeth thou this? And then when he was before Pilate, in John chapter 18, Pilate's quizzing him, are you, are you the king of the Jews? In chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And in John chapter 12, he said, I am the good shepherd. Who hears his voice? His sheep. And he leads them out. And where is he leading his sheep? Right into his kingdom. So do you hear the voice of God? Do you hear the good shepherd? Do you recognize his voice? If you don't recognize his voice, you're not going to recognize the stranger, the hireling, who doesn't care about you, only themselves, or came to kill and to destroy. It is imperative that you know the voice of Jesus Christ. Back to Colossians chapter 1. Giving thanks, verse 12, unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So now we must be eternally grateful for the dear Son <laughs> in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We have redemption in Jesus and only in Jesus. What is redemption? It's one of those words, one of those things we speak of that people who are not spiritually discerned may not know what we're talking about. Redemption is ransom. It's a payment. It's settling the debt, being ransomed from the bondage of death. And Jesus, in him we have redemption. Well, if, if there's a redemption, there must be a price. What is the price? Blood. Life. Because life is in the blood. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins. So if we stand before God and offer our blood, he says, well, whoa, uh, your blood is defiled. It's corrupt. It's defiled with sin. It's an unacceptable payment. The only acceptable ransom price is pure undefiled blood meaning a sinless life and that's why Jesus came 
as he's teaching his guys to be servants, in Matthew 20, verse 28, he said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He's the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world. He's the Lamb of God who came to be the Father's sin sacrifice on an altar of judgment. And what was that altar? The cross. And we read in Romans chapter 3, we studied this, starting verse 24, that being just justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a payment, an atonement, a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that we might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. How can God forgive a corrupt, defiled sinner with the payment of someone who's not a sinner? And we read in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from our vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And with the redemption, there in Colossians 1, with the redemption comes forgiveness of sin. Do you have any greater need in your life than to be forgiven? of your sin. No. We are told, the Father told us, all souls are mine. The soul that sins shall die. King David, when he sinned, and he was called on it, he owned it, and said in Psalm 51 verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. I sinned, I sinned against you. All my sins are against you. You are just to judge me for my sin. The son of David, Solomon, when he was dedicating the temple, said, there is no man that sinneth not. Later in his life, when he's an old man, uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 7.20 said, there is not a just, not a just man on earth that does good and sins not. And we're told that in Romans chapter 3. There's none that are righteous, no, not one. And that unrighteousness, that filth, was a revelation to us. It was a revelation by a mirror our Creator gave to us. His word, His law. In Romans chapter 5, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came with the ministry of reconciliation. Yep. Second Corinthians chapter 5. He also came with you in, 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 in the same context. He came with the ministry of stain removal. I hope we're not going to get Italian. I'll end up with stain. I'll need a stain removal. But in my life, my blood, my life was stained. Proverbs 29, 20, verse 9 says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean and I am pure from my sin? I can't. No one can. My blood is, was stained. His blood... Jesus' blood is pure. His blood purified mine. My life was purified by the pure blood of Jesus Christ. The most holy cleansing that which was unholy and making it holy. And so now by the person and the work of Jesus Christ, divine justice is satisfied. He's the end, the completion of the law for righteousness for those who believe. 
He who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so when we stand before the judge of all the earth, we'll hear two words, case dismissed. When we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This epistle is about the supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus Christ, and we're going to get more into that next week as we move on in chapter 1. But there is only one Savior from eternal death, the second death. That's the Son of God who conquered death. There's only one mediator between God and man who was given a ministry of reconciliation, that man, Jesus Christ. There is only one way to the Father who is in heaven, Jesus Christ. There is only one way to escape all the things that are coming upon the earth, the Son of Man. There's only one Lord of all, Lord of lords and King of kings, Jesus Christ. What does the Father want from us? What's the very best for us? Know Jesus, make him known. And he's revealed some amazing things in his word, spiritual truth. He gave, he gave the Jews and to the Jews, to mankind, he gave the law. What does the law do? It defines man's problem. The law declared the whole world guilty before God. Didn't justify any. You'd have to keep it perfectly. You break one part, you're guilty of breaking it all. The law wasn't given to save us from sin. The law was given to reveal our sin. Well, what's the solution then? Uh, the Messiah. He's God's solution to our problem. He had the power to lay his life down. He had the power to take it up again. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. The righteousness of God is by the faith of Jesus Christ. In him is life, and that life is light. He's the foundation of all that is right. Well, the law defines our problem. The Messiah is the solution to the problem. How does God distribute the solution? By grace. By grace. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for whosoever will believe because the just shall live by faith. And by grace through faith are you saved. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Grace is how God distributes his solution to man's problem. Faith is the conduit by which we receive it. The just shall live by faith. Abraham believed God and it's counted unto him as righteousness. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. He's done it all. The issue for mankind is life and death. The issue has been resolved. Jesus has conquered death. And he is offering his life to whosoever would take it by faith. And so, if, if God were here, maybe he, if the Father were here, maybe he'd say something like, you know, uh, I know where you all stand <laughs> relative to the issue. Uh, I know who's alive. I know who's dead. Those of you who are dead because you don't believe my testimony about Jesus Christ, do you want life? Only I can give you life. And you can receive it only by faith. Take it or leave it. Please take it. Please, please, please take it.
And the moment we do, we become new creatures in Christ. We're given the power of God to become his children. And there's nothing better on earth than being a child of God. Amen? Amen. All right, if you'd stand with me, please. Father, we thank you that you gave us your word to reveal to us our problem, which without we wouldn't have known we had a problem. But once the problem was revealed, we had no solution. But you also revealed to us that you had a solution. And by grace, you solved our problem. You gave us a measure of the faith of Jesus Christ. And through that pipe, if you will, you gave us the life of Jesus Christ. You put before all of us the choice, life and death. I pray that we have all chosen life. If you have not chosen life, if you're trying to earn God's favor, if you think there's a whole bunch of things you have to do to get your act together before God could even love you, Please hear the simple things that God is saying. He loves you. He wants you to be of the same mind as him. He wants you to accept his gift of Jesus Christ and him crucified that he might take away your sins, purify your life, and give you Jesus' life. That's the whole point of the cross. That's the transaction that happens at the foot of the cross. If you haven't gone to the foot of the cross and called on the name of the Lord for that very best gift, please do so now. In your own heart, in your own mind, there's not a script that you have to say, just call out to Jesus to forgive you and to come into your life and to clean you, make you new. For the glory of God our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.